This man needs the fire department. Yes, and lots of other people need the fire department, too. People all over the city are reporting fires. Little fires. Big fires. Everybody wants to report a fire. Well, not everybody, but that's the way it seems to the firemen of Los Angeles who respond to more than 23,000 alarms each year. Most fires are the direct result of carelessness or indifference. And it's because of these shortcomings on the part of a few that the majority of people banded together in villages, towns, and great metropolitan cities have been forced to provide defense against fire to protect their lives and property. To provide such protection, your fire department maintains fire stations in all parts of the city. The location of each is based primarily on the life hazard and property values to be protected in any given area. Consideration is also given to seeing that all areas within the city are readily accessible to fire companies with a minimum amount of travel. New construction, insofar as it is possible to do so, is in keeping with the architectural trend community. Housed within these stations are the crews and equipment of the basic firefighting unit. The engine companies, or hose carriers as they are sometimes called, are manned by firemen whose chief responsibility is to get water on a fire. With this two-piece engine company, Taking the hydrant is the first operation when going into action. The hose carrier proceeds to the fire. As its companion unit, the pumper, moves into position. As the hose carrier comes to a stop, additional hose is removed, enough to reach all sides of the fire. When this is done, the line is broken, the nozzle is put on, shut off, and the men lead in. When hose lines are in position, the pumper, taking water from the hydrant, steps up the pressure to produce efficient firefighting streams. A triple combination, or one-piece engine company, combines hose, water tank, and pump on the same unit. When a line is laid from the hydrant to the scene of a fire, a special valve enables men at the nozzle to get water at hydrant pressure immediately. That is, after tools and the necessary hose to reach the fire have been removed. After this is done, a triple combination apparatus must return to the hydrant. And as soon as the pump is hooked up, hydrant pressure at the nozzle is increased without ever shutting off the flow of water. Lack of discovery and delayed alarms result in fires of considerable magnitude. 
It is on such fires that heavy streams throwing thousands of gallons of water a minute are required. In manufacturing and industrial areas, where the possibility of conflagration is the greatest, manifold companies such as these are located. Actually, they are two-piece engine companies, differing primarily from the regular two-piece engine companies in that they carry larger diameter hose, making it possible to supply water to a great many more hose lines. Truck companies, or as they are more commonly called, hook and ladder companies, are manned by crews who have the responsibility of laddering buildings, performing rescue work and ventilating to release hot air, smoke and gases, so that men with hose lines can get to the seat of a fire to kill it at its point of origin. Hydraulically controlled aerial ladders, such as this one, are easily operated by one man. Such ladders can be raised to roofs or windows on the upper floors of high buildings to provide a means of escape for trapped persons. or to enable truckmen to reach roofs where ventilating operations normally start. Chopping holes in roofs may seem of questionable value to bystanders, but it is a most important operation in fire control. Life nets carried by all truck companies are another means of escape, but are used only as a last resort. At fires where deadly fumes and gases are encountered, gas masks afford protection. Structural conditions encountered determine the choice of ladders to be used at a fire. Hand ladders vary in length from 14 to 50 feet. From one to as many as six men are required to carry and raise them. Forcible entry, cleanup, and ventilating tools complete the truck's equipment. Salvage companies protect property from smoke and water damage. As hose lines are being laid and ladders are being raised by other basic units, the salvage men are inside, covering furniture, merchandise, stock and other property with waterproof covers. The well-trained salvage man is alert to protect most valuable items first. The use of sawdust completes the operation of keeping water away from stacked and covered furnishings. It absorbs water and is also used to form dikes or dams to control the flow of water. Once a fire has been extinguished, the work of the salvage men is just beginning. These companies are usually the last ones to leave the scene of a fire. Salvage companies are equipped with the necessary tools to combat water damage. It is their job to do the final cleanup work and leave the premises in the best possible condition.
Salvage companies are responsible for the saving of thousands of dollars worth of property each year. Their efforts throughout the years have resulted in the reduction of your fire insurance rate. The basic firefighting companies are backed up by special equipment and trained crews to handle special types of fires. Mountain patrol stations house tank trucks carrying hose and water. Although capable of drafting or obtaining water from hydrants when available, these units are a necessity in those areas far removed from a source of water. And brush fires in the 125 square miles of mountain area within our city are a constant menace. Mountain patrolmen in patrol cars equipped with hose, water, and other brush firefighting tools play an important part in the extinguishing of small brush fires. These men maintain year-round patrol and inspection. Theirs is a job of fire prevention by enforcing the strict fire regulations so necessary in this hazardous area. Bulldozers are used the year round, constructing fire breaks and fire roads to make the mountain area accessible to manpower and equipment when fire strikes. This equipment has also proved its worth in helping to bring major brush fires under control. In direct contrast to our arid mountain area, where water for firefighting purposes has long been a problem, we find a different situation at Los Angeles Harbor. Oil, lumber, and chemicals are but a few of the products of the industries that add to the potential fire hazard. Over 45 miles of waterfront with warehouses, ships, and oil-soaked piers contribute to the possibility of fire. Land-based firefighting companies protecting the waterfront are supported by fireboats capable of attacking warehouse, pier, or wharf fires from the seaward side and fires aboard ships. That is the responsibility of the fireboat crews, particularly so when such ships are out of reach of land-based companies. Seawater in abundance is supplied by powerful pumps capable of delivering thousands of gallons of water a minute for firefighting purposes. Of exceptional importance is the ability of our fireboats to supply water to land-based engine companies should the need arise. There are occasions when fires reach serious proportions. In such instances, the radiated heat may become so great that firemen with hand lines cannot approach close enough to efficiently fight the fire. Portable monitors and wagon batteries supply the great quantity of water needed. Or when such fires involve the upper floors of buildings, the water tower is the answer. Obviously, water damage is extensive, but confining this type of fire to its point of origin is a must to prevent its spread to adjoining structures. At night fires, particularly where electrical systems have been damaged, the laborious procedure of wetting down smoldering material to prevent rekindle is a problem. Utility companies, equipped with portable generators and lighting equipment, furnish the necessary illumination.
coffee urns on utility trucks furnish the firemen with their favorite drink, Java, strong, black, and hot. Oil fires present a unique firefighting problem. Fomite companies carrying cans of foam powder and portable foam generators are in constant readiness to suppress such fires. Foam powder dumped in the hopper of the generator is mixed with the moving column of water and flows from the nozzle in a sticky mass that has a strong smothering effect. Crash trucks, speedy fire control units, protect the city's airports and extinguish aircraft fires so that immediate rescue of the occupants can be accomplished. In addition, they prevent the spread of such fires to other property. Rescue companies strategically located throughout the city, respond with life-giving oxygen on all calls demanding emergency resuscitation. Firemen assigned to these units are well versed in all branches of first aid, but the majority of their calls require the administration of oxygen for respiratory failure. This condition is usually caused by drownings, electric shock, heart attacks, and the inevitable attempts at self-destruction, suicide. The duties of the fire chief may be likened to those of a general manager. He works in close alliance with a civilian board of fire commissioners who determine broad matters of policy. Routine department procedures are formulated by the deputy chief. And assistant chief officers who are in command of the three major divisions of the firefighting forces within the city. Divisions are further divided into battalions, each of which consists of a number of fire stations housing firefighting units. Each battalion is under the supervision of a battalion chief who responds to and takes charge of all fires within his battalion. He is responsible for the efficient operation of the companies under his command. Direct control of individual firefighting units is relegated to captains. Engineers or pump operators, auto firemen or drivers, tillermen, a kind of backseat driver, hosemen, truckmen, and salvage men complete the line of rank. All firemen are appointed and promoted under civil service. Applicants for original appointment are required to pass a written examination. Strenuous physical agility tests. and are subject to close medical scrutiny before acceptance. After appointment, rookies are sent to the drill tower, where they are given an intensive training course. Here a man first becomes familiar with the tools of the trade. Classroom sessions are also a part of the training course. 
Those who pass are assigned to fire companies where they serve a six-month probationary period before becoming regular members of the fire department. Here is the heart of the fire department, through which all communications pass. When the glass in a street fire alarm box is broken and the hook is pulled down, the number of the box is received on one of these registers and is immediately relayed by a selective transmitter to those firefighting units who, by prearrangement, would respond to a box alarm at that location. A quick check informs each captain of the box location, the first alarm assignment, and the additional companies that will respond on a second or greater alarm. Need for additional help can only be determined after the arrival of the first company at the fire. When fires are reported by telephone, the correct address must be given if the fire department is to send aid. A quick check of the map. And the fire dispatcher relays the address to the nearest fire companies by direct wire. In reporting the location of a fire, remember, is it street, avenue, drive, or place? Accurate check is kept of the movements of all units by the fire dispatcher. The transmission of orders to units out of quarters is expedited by the use of two-way radio. Units in the field may communicate with each other as well as with the fire dispatcher. Fires which cause a loss exceeding $100 or that appear to be of a suspicious or incendiary nature are thoroughly investigated by members of the Arson Bureau, the detectives of the fire service. Determining the cause of fires is important. It contributes greatly to fire control, for obviously, when the cause of fire is known, steps can be taken by the fire department to prevent similar occurrences. The questioning of witnesses or suspicious characters and the careful examination of evidence usually results in the apprehension of individuals guilty of the crime of arson. And, of course, ultimate prosecution. Such fires are motivated by profit, revenge, hate, or to satisfy the perverted desires of the mentally unbalanced, the pyromaniac. The prevention of fire goes hand in hand with its extinguishment and is considered by many authorities to be of equal importance. Good fire prevention practices keep unwanted fires from occurring in the first place. Fire laws and ordinances are formulated by fire prevention authorities and engineers well acquainted with the hazards 
in various occupancies and industries. Such laws are based upon past fire experience, and their prime objective is to prevent fire. Enforcement is the responsibility of the fire department. For this purpose, it maintains a fire prevention bureau. Inspectors, all of whom have had actual firefighting experience, are well versed in existing fire regulations. These men conduct thousands of inspections each year, seeking out and correcting fire and life hazards. Particular attention is given to manufacturing and industrial plants, where the potential fire hazard is most severe. A close watch is maintained in places where large numbers of people congregate. It is here that the life hazard is greatest. Hospitals and sanitariums housing bedridden and invalid persons are inspected regularly. And safety campaigns are year-round procedure in our schools. Life-saving devices are useless if they fail to operate in an emergency. And poorly maintained auxiliary firefighting appliances are worse than useless. As a breeder of fire, poor housekeeping is one of the worst offenders. Failure to cooperate in correcting such conditions may result in prosecution. Fires after 10 a.m. and faulty incinerators are also a fire prevention problem. For many years, captains of firefighting companies have made routine building inspections to acquaint themselves with conditions that might affect firefighting operations. Now, two-way radio makes it possible for entire companies to spread the gospel of fire prevention in their own district. Should fire occur while they are engaged in this work, the fire dispatcher may contact them immediately, since one man always remains within hearing distance of the radio. This program calls for personal contact with each and every homeowner to explain the common hazards responsible for most home fires and to make sure regulations governing these hazards are thoroughly understood. To further aid this educational work, the general public is reached by direct mail by newspaper releases and frequent radio broadcasts. Beyond this point, the fire department must rely on public cooperation. The fight against fire is a never-ending fight. Each year, thousands of lives are sacrificed and millions of dollars worth of property go up in smoke. The tragedy is that most fires are preventable, that human carelessness accounts for most of them. Preventing fire is everyone's job, but the control and extinguishing of fires once started is the responsibility of the fire department. To this end, modern apparatus and equipment play an important part when manned by efficient, well-trained crews. A fireman's job is a hazardous one, a job of teamwork and preparedness. He must be ready at any moment of the day or night to come to your aid when fire or disaster strikes.
by the simple expedient of dialing 116 on your telephone or by breaking the glass and pulling the hook on a street fire alarm box. The fire protective resources of your fire department are at your service. But remember, report all fires promptly. For unless you do, how can we help you? First operation when going into action. The hose carrier proceeds to the fire. As its companion unit, the pumper moves into position. As the hose carrier comes to a stop, additional hose is removed, enough to reach all sides of the fire. When this is done, the line is broken, the nozzle is put on, shut off, and the men lead in. This man needs the fire department. Yes, and lots of other people need the fire department, too. People all over the city are reporting fires. Little fires. Big fires. Every... When hose lines are in position, the pumper taking water from the hydrant steps up the pressure to produce efficient firefighting stream. A triple combination, or one-piece engine company, combines hose, water tank, and pump on the same unit. When a line is laid from the hydrant to the scene of a fire, a special valve enables men at the nozzle to get water at hydrant pressure immediately. That is, after tools and the necessary hose to reach the fire and area. Consideration is also given to seeing that all areas within the city are readily accessible to fire companies with a minimum amount of travel. New construction, insofar as it is possible to do so, is in keeping with the architectural trend community. Housed within these stations are the crews and equipment of the basic firefighting unit. The engine companies or hose carriers, as they are sometimes called, are manned by firemen whose chief responsibility is to get water on a fire. With this two-piece engine company, taking the hydrant is somebody wants to report a fire. Well, not everybody, but that's the way it seems to the firemen of Los Angeles who respond to more than 23,000 alarms each year.
most fires are the direct result of carelessness or indifference. And it's because of these shortcomings on the part of a few that the majority of people banded together in villages, towns, and great metropolitan cities have been forced to provide defense against fire to protect their lives and property. To provide such protection, your fire department maintains fire stations in all parts of the city. The location of each is based primarily on the life hazard and property values to be protected in any given